Today I want to talk to you a little bit about the law of liberty. For our guest, I'm preaching verse by verse through the wonderful letter of James. How many of you have lived long enough as a Christian that you've come to realize that the Bible really is what it says about itself? It's the law of liberty. You can read your Bibles and say, you know, it, it seems to be a restrictor of liberty. It seems to sometimes even be somewhat of a killjoy in that there's things that talks about you shouldn't do. But see, the Bible reminds us that you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. John 8, 32. But if you'll continue reading, verse 34, it says, that if you commit sin, you become a slave of sin. See, he's given us these boundaries in which we can have such freedom. Sometimes, especially a young family says, if I could break out of this boundary, I could be free. Oh, no, you wouldn't be free. <laughs> You'd be enslaved. Freedom comes by walking in the light of the law of liberty. And boy, have I ever learned that the hard way. And God has taught me so much there. So I'm telling you, this message is about to turn you upside down. I just told my wife, I said, I have the most unusual message. And she said, well, do you like it? <clears throat> yes, Miss Janet, I do. Stand with me in honor of the reading of the Bible, God's Word. Thank you for being here. What a marvelous, marvelous attendance. Bible says in verse number 10, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, one point only, he's guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy mercy triumphs over judgment <laughs> father in jesus name speak to our hearts for christ's sake amen you may be seated the beauty of James's practical, moral approach to faith is that it cuts through all the religious words and rhetoric. Remember, James uses the imperative do in referring to something that ought to be done to authenticate, evidence the Christian faith. He is the moral practitioner. He's the moral theologian. Unlike Paul that would spend so much energy on defining doctrine and theology so that we would know and certainly was a doer of what he knew. James, on the other hand, comes back almost to an extreme but both within the strands of truth and says, I don't want to just talk to you about what you know. I want to question you a little bit on what you're doing with what you know and you ought to be doing. So he's morally practical. We can fool each other with so easy quotes from the Bible and slip into some type of evangelical cliche. We can learn to give a proper Christian testimony, deliver it with apparent conviction, but that does not mean that our faith is real. And boy, when we get down to verse 14, he's going to change gears again and talk to us about faith that's not even alive, but dead faith. He's even going to talk about believing like the devil believes and not really being in a real relationship with the Lord. So James is saying that real faith is not indicated only by avoiding the big no-nos like murder and adultery, but by how we treat people, especially the needy. Now, I want you, I want you to listen to this. This is what really intrigues me about this passage. One minute he's talking about favoritism, partiality, and then all of a sudden he changes gears and says, murder and adultery and you begin to think good night I mean it's one thing to deal with you know not treating a poor person like we ought to and caring for the poor but what's that got to do with the biggies he just wants to remind us don't that we're to never take lightly what he values and so I'm telling you, he has a way of I guess the best way to say it if you're from South Georgia he'll jerk your chain and that's what James is doing he's jerking your chain so the challenge in this passage is first personal, and then it's corporate. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a responsibility 
to live the Word of God, but corporately, I have the responsibility to teach the Word of God and to do the best I can, aided by the Spirit of God, to lead you all to embrace the Word of God. So we must all means apply James's test to ourselves, but must never apply them to others in the sense that we think we know someone else's heart. Personally, how is my heart in the matter of favoritism, partiality, caring for those that are less fortunate? So the application for any church is made up of educated, uh, upwardly mobile people, and we're to be a caring community. We're to think of the poor, the disabled, the disenfranchised, and the broken as believers who intentionally submit to the Word of God. And he's going to show you just how important this is. So let me do this. Let me give you three statements we can hang our thoughts on. And the first one is the context of this passage. Now, we can't just look at it just by itself. He just said in verse number 9 that if you show favoritism, if you show partiality, you are a transgressor of the law and you have sinned. Then he turns right around and he says, uh, take adultery, for instance, and take murder. And you think, whoa, 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 don't go down that road. Let's just talk about this little stuff. James is drawing a biblical position on sin. Listen to this statement. James sees the law as a seamless garment which when it's ripped in one place tears the whole garment. He's saying it doesn't matter which of these you sin in categorically. You offend the whole law because it's seamless when you do it. Early Jewish writings and latter Jewish writings such as the Talmud made this statement about this type of uh, truth. He says, if he do all but omit one, he is guilty of all severely. James is reminding us that this law is a part of the entire law which stands as a unified whole. So partiality, murder, adultery are seen to be part of the whole. Now, to fail to treat our neighbor as ourself is to be guilty of disregarding the law of God. Now, James is not saying that all sins are the same in magnitude. Nobody should ever try to come to that conclusion. Someone says, don't matter what sin you committed, one's just as bad as the other. You don't believe that. So here's the main position. Although God's law has many facets, it is essentially one. Being the expression, here's what the law of God is. It is the expression of the character and the will of God himself. So to violate the law at any one point is not to violate one commandment only. It is to violate the will of God and to contradict the character of God. When the church of the Lord Jesus, here's what he's saying. When the church of the Lord Jesus did not in does not embrace those whom God values. The church is not representing the will of God and the character of God. I'm grateful to God that you've got a bulletin that talks about us trying to emulate the character of God to those who are underprivileged. But that's not enough. It ought to be all of us and it ought to be consistent in our life. So as I mentioned, by beginning verses 10 and 11 with the word for, James indicates that he's going to explain how the act of favoritism makes a person a lawbreaker. Now, it's apparent that James wishes to make a very special point when he speaks of someone who keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point. If you love your Bible, I know you do, you'll look and you'll find in James chapter 3 and verse 2, James later made this statement, for we all stumble in many things. I don't know about you, but I'd say, sign me up. This week, I read a book I would commend to you by Tim Keller entitled Counterfeit Gods. And in there, he just builds this incredible case how it's so easy in our culture, in our life, is believers to allow things to begin to mean too much for us. And it begins to zap the energy that ought to be given in way of glorifying God. And as a result of doing that, we lift them up as idols. You can think more of your children than you do Jesus Christ. You can think more of your spouse than you do Jesus Christ. You can think more of my preaching than I 
should and begin to elevate it up where it actually begins to be embraced more than Jesus Christ is. We all stumble. The word stumble is an interesting word. It describes an insignificant offense or error, and it's also used as a synonym to the verb to sin, but with no indication of the degree of seriousness. Now, when I'm reading my Bible every now and then, I, I write in the most unusual ways. I'll have a pen, paper out, and I'm reading everything. And I, when I come up and it says, if you, if you stumble in one point, you're guilty of all. And I think, now that is an int- attention giver, getter. The reason it's an intention getter, if you will reflect for a moment, have spiritual meditation, God will show you an area of your life where you are weak. Let me tell you what I did this week. I just thought this would be a fun exercise. Let's just walk through the Bible and see if anybody had any of those one areas they stumbled with. How about Solomon? Women. How about Moses? Temper. How about Demas? Love of this world. How about Ananias and Sapphira? Liars and keeping up the appearance. How about Judas? Love of money. How about Pilate? Love of power. How about Achan? Love of covetousness. How about Paul? Sometimes when I read a text, I'm looking for something. And if you're not careful, if you're looking for something when you're reading the text, you don't see what's there. <laughs> That's good. That, that was a good statement. Well, that, was a good, that, was, that was a good statement. I don't remember how I said it. But if you write it down, send it to me if you would. I'd, I'd appreciate it. But, but when you're reading a text and you're looking for something, sometimes you miss what it's saying because you're looking for it to say something. The Bible teaches that Paul acknowledged as he became a student of God's Word that the Lord showed him that he had an evil desire, and the word that's translated for evil desire speaks of lust. I'd never seen that. Let me read it for you. It's found in Romans 7, verse 7. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? In other words, what he's saying is, uh, since if the law is good and it's holy, but it reveals stuff in our life that is wrong, why don't we just say the law's wrong? Isn't that what a lot of people have done? Let's start, what do they say about the Ten Commandments? Get it out of the courtroom. Dear God, people get to reading that stuff. They get to reading that in the public schools. We're going to warp their minds. What we're saying is the Bible's bad. We're saying the Bible's unholy. We're saying get it out of here. I'll tell you why you want it out, because it shows your stinking sin. That's what he's saying. And so he says, what should I say then? Is the law sin? No. The law at the center, we're sinners. The law hasn't done anything wrong. We have. So what we say is get the book out that discloses my sin. By the way, while we're taking it out, they're judging cases. What are the cases they're judging? Everything the Bible speaks against. Hello? Who said it was wrong? No one knew it was wrong until the law spoke of it. Listen to the Bible. The Bible is incredible. It says on the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. Somebody says, you want to do this? I say, I can't. I don't want to. Why? God saved me and he's empowered me through the Holy Spirit not to do that. Well, do you think it's wrong? Oh, it is. How do you know? The Bible says so. It says, for I would have not known covetousness unless the law had said it. What he said is, I could always want more, want more, even to the point of trying to take what my neighbor has. But God said, that's wrong. You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me, listen to this, all manner of evil desire. It means as he began to read the Bible, God began to show him his heart. It's a mirror. It'll show you what's going on in life. It says, for apart from the law, sin was dead. <laughs> sin was dead. That's the person who doesn't go to church and say, I don't think anything's wrong with that. Don't you ever scald a blind man for not seeing. He's never seen it. But if he ever opens his Bible, he'll see it. God will say it. And that's why many times they close it or they do like a lot of Southern Baptists. It's a smorgasbord religion. They don't like that part of the Bible. He says, I was alive once without the law. What he's saying is I was alive doing good and full of joy. But when the commandments came, that is, I began to read my Bible, sin revived and I died. He said, the commandment, which was to bring life, I found it to bring death. For sin taken occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it killed me. Listen to what he says about the law. Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Let me tell you the best way to illustrate this. Remember the story? The rich, young ruler. Think about it for a moment. He's rich, he's young, and he's powerful. He's a ruler. And he comes to Jesus. And he says, good master, what have I got to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you know the law. He said, I sure do. And then Jesus began to recite it to him. Uh, don't. 
commit adultery. Uh, don't steal. Uh, don't covet. What did the young rich ruler say? All those I've known from my youth to now, and I've kept every one of them. And then Jesus oh, jerked his chain, threw the curveball. Here's what he said. <clears throat> uh, sell everything you got. Give it to the poor. Does that fit this text or what? Sell everything you got, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And the Bible says he turned on his heels, went away, and was very sorrowful. You may say, now why would Jesus tell him to do that? Because Jesus knows what Johnny does it. Jesus knows a man's heart. Jesus knew that he was a covetous rascal, that money meant more to him than God, and so he hit him right where he knew he was living, and the man was not willing to give up his sin of covetousness. Covetousness. And so he went away. Come follow me. Jesus says you'll have treasures in heaven. So certain sins don't tempt us at all. But we all have at least one area where we are vulnerable. And God help us. I'm telling you, we need in the areas our vulnerabilities, we need accountability. And we also need strategic steps in our life that by the grace of God will stay right in those areas. Areas. Now, that's the position that he takes. Let me talk to you about the principle. James is not saying that one sin is as bad as the other. Again, I'd rather come on and tell my wife I told a lie than to tell my wife I committed adultery. You do not believe that one is as bad as the other in degree. He's not saying that it would be just as bad for us to be disrespectful to someone as it would be to kill someone. He is simply saying that there is a real guilt if we violate the law at any point. Uh, you know that not every link in the chain has to be broken for the chain to be broken. There's a thousand doors to rebellion, many of them secret. For every person whose violations of the law are made public, there are thousands of us who transgress secretly. So perhaps we fall to jealousy, to pride, to self-righteousness, or to lust. However, we disobey God, we are transgressors of the law. We are sinners. Yet James calls God's law the law of liberty in verse number 12 because it frees us to enjoy the greatest fulfillment we could possibly know. How many of you know and, and have struggled with something that you're vulnerable with in your life and you even found yourself entertaining? You may have even gone a little ways down the road, but then finally you were arrested by the Spirit of God and you came to your moral senses and you got on your knees and you cried out to God and God set you free. And when you came back to church, how many of you know there was liberty in worship that you didn't know the week before? Only Christ can do that through the law of liberty. It's come to set us free. It is the sin that we think frees us that actually puts us in bondage, and it's the law we think restricts us that actually brings us into liberty. So if a law that we obey, not because of fear of punishment or because we're coerced into it, but because God plants his love in our lives, and this love causes us to want to obey the law. One of the great verses is 1 Thessalonians 4 and 9, where he says, For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. So he, he begins by saying, let's put it in this context. Here's the context. I'm talking to you about favoritism, and I'm not getting your attention. The church of the Lord Jesus needs to personally and corporately care for people that sometimes they overlook that God values. And so evidently, James didn't get their attention very much, and so he looks out and he says, by the way, while we're talking about it, let's talk about adultery, and let's talk about murder. Oh, everybody perks up. And they think, what's this got to do with the subject? He says everything. Because whether you show favoritism or you these others, you still are a transgressor of the same law, which is seamless. So he's trying to say again, what I value, I want the church to value. Let me go a step further. He moves from talking about the context to talk about the conduct of these people. And he, he does it two ways in verse number 12. Let me give it to you. It's real simple. He talks about their conduct in light of the exhortation. He makes an appeal. And then he comes back in light of an admonition. Exhortations are to encourage. Admonitions are to warn. One is an appeal. The other brings us to an awareness. 
But one thing about church, if we'll come and I pray in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you'll set up and you'll listen and you'll maybe print off my notes and maybe sit there and mark your Bibles and let your Bible mark you. I believe that God can take his word and make you aware of some things you may not have been aware of. Now, what does he want us to make aware of? Listen to verse number 12. This is incredible what he says in this passage. He says, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. The Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John said, you will be judged by the words which I have spoken. You will be judged by the words which I have spoken. What will be the standard of judgment at the great white throne judgment as well as the bema, the judgment seat of Christ? The Bible, the word of God. So he says, so speak and so do. Let me tell you something I love about my Bible. When you study it carefully, here's what you find out. The words that he uses there are emphatic in their delivery. Uh, it, they're emphatic in that it, 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 it brings equality when he says speak and do. It's equality. It's not one more of one than more of the other. How many of you would agree that Southern Baptists are better at speaking than at doing? All over, all over, think of this, 43,000 Southern Baptist Church, 6,000 mission, 50,000 preaching points this morning, and preachers are going to stand up and speak. And then they're going to break into small groups, and we have over 300, Alan, and they're going to speak. But I'm telling you, he says emphatically, showing equality, I want you to stand and speak, but Johnny Hunt, if you stand and speak and you do not do personally and the church does not do corporately, you have only partially obeyed my word. And the last time I checked, partial obedience is... And I'm telling you, it's a whole lot easier to talk about going to the nations than going to the nations. It is easier to talk about giving sacrificially than giving sacrificially. It is easier to talk about loving loud and not showing partiality than it is doing it. So emphatically, with equality, here's a statement that leaders use. What gets done is that which gets inspected. You know what Jesus said? good because I'm one day going to expect, inspect what you do. It's called the bema, the reviewing stand. W what are we going there for? Somebody says, well, thank God when we go there. Thank God for Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation. And by the way, let me just say, hallelujah, that's the truth. But let me do this. Instead of putting an exclamation mark there, instead of putting a period there, could I put a comma there? because of systematic theology and make this statement, no, there will be no condemnation, but comma, there will be inspection. There will be inspection. He is going to inspect what we have done. And so this text reminds us of James 1, 26 and 27. What we say needs to be accompanied by corresponding actions. Here, here's what church ought to be like. Oh, this is good. Church ought to be coming together, opening our Bibles, open our hearts, open our hearts and minds to God in our ears, allowing God to speak into our hearts, taking our Bibles. And in Europe, what they used to do is they'd sit an hour after the sermon for spiritual meditation to take in what they'd heard and ask God how they would respond. Then you're to take your Bible under your blessed arm. Get up off your blessed assurance and go out and do something with it. You're to be Jesus. In light of the exhortation, there's an appeal. But then secondly, in light of the admonition, there is awareness. The Bible says there's those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Romans 14, 12, so then each of us shall give an account of God, of himself to God. Romans 14, 10, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I found a translation that really gives me my favorite text. And if you're going to preach and you wanted to give the greatest clarity from any single passage on the judgment seat of Christ, without exception, you would always teach 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 through 15. Listen to this rendering. True. Some believers' works will be seen as gold, silver, and costly stones. But others will suffer immense shame for their wood, hay, and straw. Truly, our work will be shown for what it is. Because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's works. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, 
but only as one escaping through the flames. Now, this passage really challenges me. Let me tell you what I know. Based on Romans 8 and 1, based on the eternal, eternal security of the believer, based on the fact that what I believe about once saved, always saved, whether you agree with it or not, you have the right to be wrong. But the bottom line is, in the text of the fact that God has eternally secured me in a relationship with him, I know theologically that I will survive the judgment seat of Christ. But let me tell you what is yet to be told. Will what I've done for Jesus survive? When God says, Johnny did this, you thought. But his motive was really this. And this is what it really is. This is what you thought it was. This is what it <laughs> really is. And God will show the quality of the work. And it says that some works that we have built will not survive. And so he says, the reason I'm shaking you the way I am about adultery and murder, the biggies, if you say, the pride, is because you've not taken serious this favoritism business. And one day you're going to stand before me and I'm going to show you the thousands of opportunities that I placed in your path and that you missed. Have you ever thought that if God is providential and God is sovereign? I mean, here I am, a pastor of a church raised in a government project. Do you not believe that God ordered my steps? You don't believe God brought me? You don't think it's an act of grace that God changed my life, that God took a kid that wouldn't give a book report, and now I can put words together, sometimes more than you want to hear and longer than you want to sit through. He is undoubtedly, I'm not saying I'm good at what I do, but I'm telling you I'm gifted at what I do. God, God sovereignly from heaven gave me what I have to serve him. I don't have the right to stand here and talk about how I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I worked hard at Gardner Webb College. I did good there at Southeastern Seminary. No, I'm telling you what it was. All through that where I thought I was doing something, if you'll look carefully, you'll see the hand of God. It's undeniable. God sovereignly leading me, pointing me, directing me to be where I am. I'll tell you it's time for the church right now instead of thinking about what you've done to be where you are, is stand up and give God the glory for putting you where you are and showing you the favor that you've experienced to God be the glory great things God has done it's not what you've done for him it's what he's done for you